It is the season of gently falling rain, autumn in other countries, here eternal summer. At the end of a long avenue of trees, I have come to look behind me and see you standing at its head. You were always ahead of me, and now I've stayed behind to see you go ahead of me again. I hear a call, come. I look for my shoes, but you go, born ahead of your time, leaving me here, the one born after my time. See, the tree you planted sprouts green leaves. Seeing you beneath it, I weep. And to see me weep, you smile. So, um, it matters to me to be allowed to read in uh, the city in which I grew up a little bit. Uh, went to college here, <coughs> came here for my holidays, was here as a child. But uh, I'm, I'm also very moved that Hoshan should ask me to do this particular si lecture for his sister, who mattered to him so much. Okay, mm -hmm. now that was the preamble, this is the lecture. He asked me to lecture on uh, the use of myth and fable in my work, so I've called it Myths Mutate. That is their power. So I'll start with a story. It's called From the Panchatantra. In the holy city of Banaras, there lived a Brahmin who, as he walked by the river bank, watching the crows floating up downstream, feeding in the remains of half burnt corpses, consoled himself thus. It is, it is true that I am poor, but I am a Brahmin. It is true that I have no sons, but I myself am indisputably a maid. I shall return to the temple and pray to Lord Vishnu to grant me a son. He went off to the temple, and Lord Vishnu listened, and Lord Vishnu complied, but whether through absent-mindedness or whether for some other more abstruse reason, he gave him a daughter. The Brahmin was disappointed. When the child was old enough, he called her to him and delivered himself thus, I am a Brahmin. You are my daughter. I had hoped for a son. No matter. I will teach you what I know, and when you are able, we will both meditate and seek guidance. Though only a woman, she was a Brahmin, and so she learned very fast. And then they both sat down and meditated hard. In a very short time, Lord Vishnu appeared. What do you want, he said. The Brahmin couldn't stop himself. He blurted out quickly, I want a son. Very well, said the god. Next time around. In his next incarnation, the Brahmin was a woman and bore eight sons. And what do you want, he said to the girl. I want human status. Ah, that is much harder. And the god hedged and appointed a commission. <laughs> Clearly, this is not from the Panchatantra. <laughs> but pretending it is allows me to suggest that perhaps it might have been or should have been. And to protest against the extreme preference for boys that still persists in our society. Writers are rapacious. Hmm? And not because they're innately wicked, but because of their craft. Hoshang and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, not this, but do we agree about writing? And we suspect we do. He says he wouldn't have asked me if we didn't. So maybe <laughs> it's just he won't find out what I really think till this lecture's over. They make their own work out of the body of literature to which their work belongs. And and out of, 
and out of that, and out of, out, out of that, and out of their own experience. What Yeats called, on the one hand, monuments of unaging intellect, and on the other, the rag and bone shop of my heart. Yeah. Of the literary forms, lyric poems and fables are highly referential because they're such concentrated forms. Each word has to do the work of six and relate to the other words in several different ways all at once. So words can't be wasted on setting the scene or offering explanations. The idea is to produce something new by using the power of the old without being overpowered by the old. Literature doesn't progress in the sense that modern works are better than ancient ones. But each writer has to make it new. That's Ezra Pound's phrase, a great, great favorite of uh, Hoshard. Make it new in terms of her own experience and her own time. And each writer works within a tradition, whether she or he wants to or not. For example, an Indian writer writing in English works within the English literary tradition, a patriarchal tradition in which women in the home are supposed to be silent and in which the term Indian suggests something exotic among other things. And it's here that the realization that the metaphors are malleable and myths mutate is useful. From the point of view of the writer, a myth is only an extended metaphor, and the power of the myth can be used for her or his own purpose. I'll give you an example. In the standard version of the Greek myth, the god Apollo falls in love with Daphne. You know the story? A little bit? Okay. He's always falling in love with somebody or the other, but this one, Daphne. And then turns her into a laurel. Okay? It's a story that has been used or referred to by many different poets. Here's one more version. It's called Nymph. Um, actually, I wrote it for my first year students because they kept asking me once they understood there was a metaphor in poems, there were metaphors in the. And then what does that mean? But you'll see. This is called the nymph. The god chases Daphne. Daphne runs away. Daphne is transformed into a green laurel. What does it mean? That that's what happens to ungrateful women? Daphne says, yes, next time. She says, yes, yes, yes. Apollo is pleased. Then he gets bored. Girl chases God. It is not very proper. Daphne gets changed. Into what has she changed? Daphne is changed into a green laurel. What does it mean? That that's what happens to ungrateful women. Daphne says yes. Then she keeps quiet. Her timing is right. Daphne gets changed. Into what has she changed? Daphne is changed into a green laurel. And what does it mean? It means, it obviously means, that trees keep quiet. <laughs> now, no one worships the Greek gods anymore. No sacrifices are made, and their temples are in ruins. I'm hardly likely, pretty likely to be lynched for mocking Apollo. But there are other religions that are still alive, and for the writer to use these myths simply as literature can be dangerous. I don't need to spell that out, do I? You can uh, think of many instances. For some practitioners of a religion, their particular version of a story and their particular interpretation of it is the literal truth. Anyone altering it in any way is then guilty of the most offensive heresy. To some extent, and in some places, attitudes have changed. 
sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. And I don't think I'll be hauled up before the Inquisition for the following story, the one I'm about to read. I came to write it because one day I ran into one of my women's study students coming out of a class on Milton in tears and crying. I asked her what was wrong, and she said, the sexism of the Adam and Eve story, the implications that it was all Eve's fault, really bothered her, but she didn't know how she could possibly question the lecturer, never mind Milton himself. Okay. I felt bad about it too, but then I cheered up and I wrote the following fable. I'll read that to you. It's called the Saurian Chronicles. Saurian as in lizard, dinosaur, Saurian, yeah. Two lizards in a rock are sunning themselves. It's early in October. The rains have just stopped. The younger lizard, wishing to be amiable, says to the elder, O oh, wisest of lizards, O oh, long-lived one, tell me once again, if you think it is proper, of the world's beginning. The old lizard's tongue flickers for a moment. Her eyes cloud over. She opens her eyes and begins. Know then that the sun is a lizard, a fire-breathing dragon, and the earth is an egg. The sun warms the earth. That, my dear, is the essential wisdom. In the very beginning, as the great mother lizard warmed the earth, rocks split open, mountains cracked, and the giant lizards, our first ancestors, saw the light of the sun. Imagine, if you can, their gigantic proportions, their fiery energy, their tremendous strength. Continents were their playing fields. They flew through the skies and sported in the ocean. The eggs that they laid gleamed like domes on the world's horizon. They were the mothers, the first mothers. And all would have been well had the mothers not asked the Supreme Mother for male companions. The sun, in her bounty, granted their wish. At first, the little fellows were playful and happy. But in time, they turned to mischief and turned the mothers from the worship of the one. Then she grew angry. Her wrath was terrible. She punished the mothers. And that is why, my dear, we have all been reduced to such diminutive proportion. The old lizard stopped. The young lizard squirmed. There was something about the story that he didn't really like. But what could he say? It was the ancient wisdom. Now, that just makes people smile or at worst, fail to smile. But people sometimes do take offense because of stories. From a religious point of view, a myth may be in, uh, from a religious point of view, a myth may be immutable. But from a literary point of view, a myth has many possibilities. My primary purpose as a writer is to write the very best fable or poem that I can for its own sake. It is not to engage in religious controversy or to, or to the primary purpose, or to protest against casteism, sexism, homophobia, racism, and other stupidities. But as a fabulist, I have to admit that it's fun to make a point. The fable is, after all, a didactic form, and a model is expected. Politics isn't necessarily something that writers must eschew, and ordinary folk must refrain from. Surely its basis, its true basis, is ethics, a desire to make things better than they are. 
and not just a hunger for power, which is what we think politics is and we watch what goes on. Surely, when injustice is rife and the world is in a particularly powerless state, as it is now, it is the duty of writers to speak out and not just of writers. I've always had trouble with the notion of justice that tries to maintain that the status quo, uh, that, that tries to maintain the status quo, when the status quo itself is unjust. But I, uh, but I don't start writing a fable by saying to myself, now, I'm going to make a point about justice. It's not how it happens. <coughs> Here's a variation on Aesop's fable about the mouse and the lion. The mouse and the lion. One day, a lion caught a mouse. Spare me, said the, I'm going to ham it up. Spare me, said the mouse. I am so little and you are so big. But who knows, perhaps someday I will be able to do you a favor. The lion thought this funny and let the mouse go. But a few days later, the very same lion was caught in a net. After a while, the mouse came along. Help, roared the lion. Help, little mouse, hew through these ropes. Remember, after all, that you owe me a favor. The mouse started chewing and then suddenly stopped. Why have you stopped, roared the lion. Well, I just thought of something, said the little mouse. You see, I think I have already done you a favor. You haven't, roared the lion. Yes, I have, said the mouse. What, roared the lion. Well, you see, said the mouse, I haven't killed you. <laughs> now, the fable began in my head with the memory of a colleague saying to someone much taller than she was, I'll tell you the truth, it was when I was in, as he said, I was in the IS for a short while. At the academy, there were these uh, letter boxes, and this colleague of mine was short, so, uh, and I think probably a little bit flirtatious, so she would say, you are so big, Mr. So-and-so, and I am so little, would you please do me a favor to reach up to that? And it stuck in my head, and that turned into the mouse saying to the lion, you are so big. It wasn't, I am going to write a fable about justice. Uh, this coalesced with the image of the man talking to the lion. And after that, the fable just followed its own logic. Okay? And as it was written by someone who has always questioned social inequality, that was the logic it followed. A feminist is likely to write a feminist fable, but the form itself can be used for any purpose. Do you see? Art is related to play. A poem or a fable is a pattern of sound, images, and ideas. And the writer plays with the building blocks to see how they might fit into a different pattern. The literary effort of itself is always revolutionary and always conservative. Well, I'll explain why. It's because using a word in a particular way reinforces its meaning as the reader has to understand it. Do you see? But using a word within the context of a poem also alters the meaning, and to that extent, the perception of the reader is changed. And so the power of an existing fable or an existing myth can be used to project a different interpretation or make a different point. Similarly, the very conventions of a particular form can help one bring the story or the poem to an unlikely conclusion, which nevertheless has an inevitability about it and the consequent authority. For example, the driving force of the narrative, you expect the story to go along. That driving force can do this in a fable. As expectation, an, expectation, an expectation is set up, which the writer can take advantage of to say the unexpected. And the unexpected is often the obvious. This is the strange thing. 
the child who said the emperor has no clothes is a type of the poet. She or he sees clearly and states the obvious, which can be shattering because we work so hard to obfuscate that which is obvious. In the poem about to read, it's the characteristic closing couplet of a Shakespearean sonnet that is particularly effective. But as, as, as you know, there's that clinching couplet usually at the end. You can use that for your own purpose. Okay? So here I use a different bit. As you know, Perseus killed Medusa, who had the power of turning men into stone by looking at them. Well, usually men. <laughs> so, look, Medusa. Medusa, living on a remote shore, troubled no one. Fish swam, birds flew, and the sea did not turn to glass. All was as before. A few broken statues lay untidily on the lonely beach, but other than these, there was nothing wrong with that peaceful scene. And so, when the hero Perseus came to seize the Gorgon's head, he thought he might have been mistaken. He watched for a while, but she turned nothing to stone. The waves roared as waves whim, till at last the hidden hero burned to be seen by her whom he had come to kill. Look, Medusa, I am Perseus, he cried thus gaining recognition before he died. <laughs> there isn't a hard and fast line that separates a literary work from religion or polemics. Literature isn't necessarily antithetical to a religious vision or a, or a political stance, but the way in which it works does militate against dogma and rigidity nor does it have to have a religious or a political theme. It deals with the human experience, with grief, with death, with love, with the passage of time. The poem about to read refers back to the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. It's called Deaf Eurydice, or Suki, who died on the 27th of July, 1997. Sometimes, the murmur of longing is so tentative, and the thought of a caress so tangential that the senses strain to hear what, after all, cannot be said. And it's then that the temptation arises to write a lie on the water, scribblings on sand, or to describe from the way the leaves moved and the light fell what shadows portend. This is twilight time, Orpheus time, Demeter time, when they call the long dead, and deaf Eurydice struggles to hear, and hearing nothing falls behind, till her footfall makes no imprint save on the mind. The poems and fables I've read so far have all made reference to other myths and fables. But a poem doesn't always have to be referential in that way. This one is called To Be a Poet. Saying that this is what it felt like to put the right foot forward and then the left. Saying that this was the taste of morning porridge, that of milk and this other of a niggling but persistent pain, saying, that, I suppose, was what was distinctive, being unable to keep my mouth shut, my mind from working. But a poet lives like any other creature, talks, perhaps, more than is normal, but her doom no brighter, nor her death less dismal than any other. Now, although there's no reference to any particular myth, the poem can be seen as a variation on the archetype of the poet. Do, do, do you see, it can have a displaced myth. 
new and different patterns are constantly being formed and reformed out of the body of literature, and these become part of the whole. We live in time. Time flows to us, and when it stops, we, we stop. Poetry doesn't try to freeze time. It uses time to make a pattern. But the pattern is in the movement of the poem. It's this effort to find stillness in movement that marks the language of poetry. Now, it seems to me, but then I am biased, that it's poetry more than any other endeavor that struggles with language against the rigidity that limits our thinking. That is why it allows mystics to say the unsayable and to frame the paradoxical. Perhaps the, this is not really my, what I, but I'll say it. Perhaps the truly religious life is not an adherence to dogma so much as daily meditation on the core metaphors in an effort to understand more and more deeply what they might mean. The use of myth and metaphor doesn't just belong to poets. As I've said elsewhere, poetry is the language of the human animal. We are symbol-making creatures. Our daily speech is littered with metaphors. Words are charged by the history, by each use of them. But for words to retain their charge, they have to be spoken and they have to be heard. This joyful playing with language is a joint enterprise, or rather a collaborative one. Here and now, between us, we generate the common cultural space in which a poem grows. That is what we've made just now. A poem rises between the speaker and the listener. It is recreated each time it is heard. It's then that it lives. It is the poet in the listener that responds to the poet in the speaker. And so to celebrate this collaborative enterprise and our being together here, here's the last poem. As you will see, it has a great many allusions to the two Alice books in Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. It's called All the Words. All the words have leaped into air, like the cards in Alice, like birds flying, forming, reforming, swerving and rising, and each word says it is love. The cat says it is love. It says, I am and I love. And the fawn in the forest who lost his name, he eats from your hand. He tells you, my name is love. And all white knight's baggage rattles and cries it is love. And even the tiger lily, even the rose, say only that they are themselves and they say they are love. All the little words say they are love, the space in between, the link and logic of love. And I can make no headway in this heady grammar, and suddenly and here, you are, I am, and we love. Thank you. Thank you.